Hi, my name is Hannah Rempel, and I'm presenting on research by myself and colleagues, Dr. Kelly Bodwin and Dr. Ben Ruttenberg on the impacts of parrotfish predation on a major Caribbean reef building coral. Coral cover on reefs worldwide has sharply declined in the past 50 years. And this decline is particularly pronounced in the Caribbean, where coral cover has decreased by more than half since the 1970s, while algae cover on reefs has increased dramatically. This decline is attributed to multiple global and local scale stressors, including increased ocean temperatures, coastal development, and overfishing, particularly of herbivorous fishes. Herbivory by fishes and invertebrates helps to limit the growth of algae on reefs, which compete with coral. Herbivory is believed to indirectly facilitate coral recruitment, growth, and survivorship. On many reefs across the globe, parrot fishes are one of the dominant herbivores. While parrot fishes predominantly graze upon algae, some species are also occasional coralivores or coral predators and can thereby have direct negative impacts on reef building corals. Research from both the Caribbean and Indo-Pacific suggests that parrot fishes do not typically target corals over other food sources. But given their abundance on coral reefs, even occasional coral livery could have negative impacts on heavily targeted coral species. To compare the direct negative impacts on parrotfish coral livery with previous studies on the indirect positive impacts of herbivory, we need to better understand the long-term consequences of coral livery for coral tissue loss. So what do we know about the impacts of parrotfish predation on corals? Research has shown that coral livery can cause partial to total mortality of both juvenile and mature coral colonies. Furthermore, coral livery may have long-term impacts on corals, such as reduced reproduction and growth, and recent work suggests it may also alter coral microbial communities. Parrotfish have selective predation on particular coral species, and research suggests that this selective predation may alter the abundance and distribution of heavily targeted species. However, the total amount of coral tissue regeneration from parrotfish predation, the time span over which colonies heal, and the factors that impact these processes remain poorly understood. And addressing these knowledge gaps is critical to better understanding the impacts of parrotfish coral livery for coral tissue loss. Parrotfish prey upon multiple coral species, but heavily target Orbicella annularis, which is both a major reef building coral and an IUCN red list endangered species. In this image, you can see multiple paired predation scars on this Orbicella annularis coral. And while the majority of these scars are relatively small, as you can see in this video, parrotfish will occasionally repetitively graze coral colonies, creating large contiguous grazing scars. This led us to four research questions that we think are integral to understanding the impacts of parrotfishes on this important framework building coral. What factors influence parrotfish bite scar healing rates in Orbicella annularis? What is the time span over which tissue regeneration occurs? What factors influence the total proportion of scar tissue regeneration? And what is the predicted coral tissue loss from a standing stock of fresh bite scars present at a moment in time? To address these questions, we conducted research on two islands, St. Croix in the US Virgin Islands and Bonaire in the Dutch Caribbean. To quantify parrotfish bite scar healing rates, we monitored Orbicella annularis colonies with fresh parrotfish grazing scars over time returning colonies every few days to photograph scars and assess changes in scar area. On St. Croix, we monitored colonies for 28 days because experimental studies on healing of artificially inflicted lesions suggest that the majority of tissue regeneration occurs within the first month. The lesions will continue to heal for up to approximately 60 days. Therefore, in 2019, we conducted 64 days of monitoring on Bonaire to track the full duration of scar healing from parrotfish predation. In addition, at each site, we surveyed the size and abundance of Orbicella annularis within belt transects. For each colony with bite scars present, we recorded the colony water depth, the scar abundance per colony, and the size of each new scar. Now I'm going to talk about our first two research questions. What factors influence parrotfish bite scar healing rates in Orbicella annularis, and what is the time span of tissue regeneration? We considered the following factors that previous research suggested may influence scar healing rate. Initial scar area, time, the island on which scars were monitored, the abundance of scars per colony ranging from 1 to 26 scars, 
the water depth of colonies ranging from 4 to 13 meters, and the size of colonies ranging from 10 to 1,569 centimeters squared. Based on BIC model selection, the best predictive model of scar healing rate included initial scar area and time. In this graph, you'll see that there are both size-based and temporal limits in coral tissue regeneration. We observed that smaller scars had a higher initial healing rate, but across all scars, the majority of tissue regeneration occurs within the first month, and scars had minimal healing after approximately 45 days. To illustrate this point, here we see two scars. Scar A was a relatively small lesion, while scar B was a much larger lesion, presumably from repetitive predation. Scar A healed within 10 days, whereas in contrast, scar B began to be colonized by algae by approximately day 12, and by day 43, we see no visible change in the scar surface area, and we see a greater growth of algae within the scar area. The next research question that we wanted to address was, what factors influence the total proportion of scar tissue regeneration? As a reminder, on St. Croix, we monitored scars for up to 28 days, the duration over which the majority of healing occurs. While on Bonaire, we monitored scars for up to two months, a time span that encompasses the total duration of tissue regeneration. To compare patterns in tissue regeneration between these regions, we first subset data from Bonaire to an equivalent time span to that of St. Croix. Based on model selection, we found that the best model included the initial scar surface area only. To estimate the total percent tissue regeneration over the full time span of healing, we then used data from Bonaire where scars were monitored for approximately two months, the full estimated duration of tissue regeneration. We found that similar to the previous model, the best model included initial scar surface area only. As you can see from this graph, as the initial area of scars increased, the total percent tissue regeneration decreased. But you can also see that there are clear size-based thresholds where scars less than 0.24 centimeters squared always fully healed, and scars greater than 1.25 centimeters squared never fully healed. The other notable pattern is that in scars greater than approximately 8 centimeters squared, there's 25% or less tissue regeneration. So what is the predicted Orbicella annularis tissue loss from a standing stock of bite scars? To address this, we applied our model of scar healing based on initial area to surveys of the standing stock of fresh bite scars present at a point in time. We observed that the vast majority of scars were relatively small. 87% of scars were 1.25 centimeters squared or less and predicted to cause minimal coral tissue loss. While large scars are rare, in this graph you can see that large scars are predicted to cause a disproportionate level of tissue loss. So while only 6% of scars were approximately 8.2 centimeters squared or greater, these scars were predicted to cause 96% of total coral tissue loss from coral livery. In conclusion, we found that there are temporal thresholds in coral tissue regeneration, where similar to previous experimental studies, our work suggests that the majority of tissue regeneration occurs within the first 30 days, and scars have minimal healing after approximately 45 days in Orbicella annularis. We also observed that there are size-based thresholds in healing, where scars less than 0.24 centimeters squared fully healed, while scars greater than 1.25 centimeters squared never fully healed. And scars greater than approximately eight centimeters squared had minimal tissue regeneration. We observed that the majority of the standing stock of scars are relatively small and predict that these scars may fully heal, resulting in minimal tissue loss. In contrast, while larger scars were rare, we estimate they may cause disproportionately high levels of coral tissue loss. So what's next? Future work should quantify healing from parrotfish bite scars and other heavily targeted coral species, such as Parietes estriates and Parietes parietes. Furthermore, this study provides estimates of the tissue loss from a standing stock of parrotfish bite scars at a point in time. Research is needed to estimate the rate at which new scars are inflicted over time to better understand the amount of tissue loss from chronic parrotfish predation. And last but not least, it's important to determine ecological factors that may influence the size and abundance of bite scars. Forthcoming research from our lab seeks to address this last question. With that, I'd like to acknowledge and thank all those who helped to support this research. And I'd like to give a particular thanks 
to the undergraduate students that I've had the distinct pleasure of working with over the course of this study. Thank you all, and thank you for your interest in our research.